Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories featuring Parallel Worlds Placebo by David Mason The Doorway by Evelyn E. Smith Back to Julie by Richard Wilson A Hitch in Time by Frederick Pohl Never Meet Again by Algis Bidris Placebo by David Mason Originally published in Infinity Science Fiction, November 1955 Narrated by Tom Trissel each 1955 was worse than the last. The object appeared in the middle of Main Way, about 50 feet from the statue of Vachel Lindsay, at least a hundred from anything else. It was much too big and complicated to have been hidden anywhere, and it hadn't any wheels, tracks, wings, or other visible means of movement. Corrigan, looking the object over, decided that it could not have come from any logical place in the world. Not being prejudiced, he then thought a little about the illogical places, and the places that weren't in the world. Corrigan decided that it must have been another attempt at time travel, and he clucked his tongue sympathetically. Well, someone had to break the news. Corrigan arose from the grass and walked toward the object. There was a young man sitting in the object, on a sort of high saddle. He looked a little wild-eyed, and he seemed to be talking to himself as he pulled and twisted at the rows of controls in front of him. Corrigan, looking up at him, decided that he couldn't be very healthy and that the stiff grey garments he wore must be extremely uncomfortable. "'Greetings, traveller!' Corrigan called. "'You're speaking English!' the young man exclaimed. "'Good! Maybe I can get some help here. What year is this?' Nineteen fifty five by most systems. The young man turned a little paler. I just left nineteen fifty five, he said unhappily. Four times, in fact. Four different nineteen fifty fives, and each one's a bit worse. Now the machine won't work. Your theory's wrong, Corrigan said calmly. Hasn't it occurred to you yet that time travel might be impossible? The young man made a choked sound. He began to climb down from his perch, keeping his eyes fixed suspiciously on Corrigan as he did so. He saw Corrigan as a small brown man, dressed in loose blue trousers, barefooted, and with a puff of white hair that seemed never to have been properly cut. The lawns and grassy roads, the bright and impermanent-looking buildings, and Corrigan himself, all added up to one thing in the young man's mind. "'You're wrong,' Corrigan said. "'I'm not a lunatic, and this isn't an asylum. "'We don't have them.' "'The young man on the ground now stared at Corrigan in evident horror. "'Mind reading?' "'More or less,' Corrigan said. "'It saves time. "'For instance, you're Darwin Lenner, "'and you'd like very much to get back to wherever you started from. "'In fact, you have to, or something unpleasant might happen to you, by your standards.' "'I'll be absent without permission,' Lena admitted. "'I I wish you wouldn't do that.' "'Only when absolutely necessary,' Corrigan smiled. "'I'm a philosopher by trade myself, not a mind-reader. "'My name is Philip Corrigan, and I'll be very glad to help you on your way. "'But I think it might be a little difficult. "'We aren't really a very mechanically-minded people here.' "'Lena ran his hands through his hair. "'I've got to get back. "'Isn't there anybody who knows something about time-machines?' Corrigan had been thinking swiftly. He had also been carrying on a conversation which Lena could not possibly hear with a man who was several miles away. Burwell, he wants to go home. Fine, he ought to. Why doesn't he? He lost his confidence. He thinks his machine's broken down. That kind, eh? I suppose the thing never really did work very well. Most of them don't. They go travelling around hit or miss through probability under the operator's own mental stream. But this fellow probably comes from a world where an idea like that's illegal. 
Sounds like it. Corrigan, take him on a guided tour or something, and keep him busy. I'll be over as soon as I can. I'm going to do something for his self-confidence. Here's the story to give him. Corrigan had always enjoyed conducting guided tours, and he was enjoying this one especially well. He had a slightly wicked taste for complicated teasing, and Lena was a perfect object. He had evidently come from one of the more unpleasant probabilities, a world full of complex rules and harshly restrictive. Anything that he saw bothered him. The handsome girls, wearing unstrategically placed flowers and very little else, the flocks of children, as plentiful as pigeons and apparently as free of supervision, the almost total absence of anybody actually performing useful work, all of it contributed to Lena's increasing nervousness. The guided tour went in a wide circle, and Lena and Corrigan wound up sitting in a tavern facing on Mainway. Lena ignored the green drink before him and peered unhappily out the big window toward his machine. "'Where is that friend of yours?' he asked for the fifth time. "'He'll be here,' Corrigan assured him. "'Why hurry? Don't you like it here?' Lena's mouth hardened. He looked around him and shook his head. "'No,' he spoke almost apologetically. I'm sorry. Well, look, old fellow, no hard feelings, I hope, but this world of yours is primitive. Degenerate, I'd say. Primitive? No laws, not even morals. Those girls. And, of course, you don't have any civilised advantages, not even ground transportation. That man you spoke of has to walk here, and that's something else I don't understand. You say he's another time traveller Probability traveller, actually. Corrigan corrected. All right, probability. Why does he stay here? Why would a really intelligent man give up civilization? Well, you know how it is. He's gone native, you might say. Life among the lotus eaters and all that. Might happen to anybody, even yourself. Lana shuddered. It's all right, though, Corrigan continued. He'll be here any minute, and I'm sure he'll be able to help. Knows all there is to know about these machines. In fact, here he comes now. Burwell entered, and Corrigan could hardly suppress a small chuckle. Burwell had picked up Lena's ideas about what a man of intelligence and authority ought to look like, and had gone to some trouble to look the part. He was wearing a uniform of some sort, spectacles, and an expression of extreme wisdom. "'I'm sure I can repair what's wrong,' Burwell told Lena. "'Let's go and look at your machine.' Arriving, Burwell climbed over the mechanism with an air of bored ability, occasionally thumping at something, adjusting something else, or hitting a part with a tool until it rang. He muttered to himself as he worked, allowing the sound of his musings to drift in Lena's directions. Hmm, badly twisted impeller. The varish is more or less waffled. Let's see if... Ah, there we are. He climbed down and solemnly shook hands with Lena. Fine machine you've got there, my boy. It'll take you back to your own place quite easily now. There wasn't a thing wrong except the drift crotch. However, I wouldn't use it again if I were you. There's no real control on these things. A man could end up anywhere. And, of course, you'd never find your way back here without control. Well, thanks, Lena said doubtfully. He glanced around. It's a shame there's no way we could regularly communicate between our worlds. There's a lot we could do for this one. I'm sure of that, Burwell said, hastily looking away. But it isn't worth the danger and difficulty of reaching us. For myself, it doesn't matter any more. He assumed a nobly tragic expression. But you are young. You've got your life ahead of you. Your state and your society need you. I'm glad to help you on your way. Lena mounted the machine, and Burwell beamed a thought at Corrigan. I've convinced him that the thing works, and that it would not be easy to come back. Actually, that machine of his is a real work of art. It doesn't do a damn thing. This boy comes from a place where they have to have a mechanical crutch for everything. His gadgets are pink pill stuff. Something to convince him he can do things he could do anyway. All we have to do now is give him a small mental shove to help him along, and he'll be home in no time. All right now, shove! Corrigan and Burwell shoved. Lena and his machine faded and were gone, leaving only a flattened place on the grass. Brrr, Burwell said. Am I glad that worked. 
If he'd stayed another week or so, we would have to have our first lunatic of the century. Or worse, Corrigan said, stirring the grass with his toes. Did you get what he was thinking about when he talked about his world and ours getting into touch and civilizing us? I got it all right, Burwell said. The fellow's mind was a swamp, a real primitive, and just like any other primitive, all he needed was a placebo from a witch doctor. Me and my savage regalia. Just let me get this thing with the glass in it off my nose, and these button things opened up a bit, and we can get on with that chess game. I hope the next traveller picks somewhere else to land, though. I've never felt so silly in my life. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Doorway by Evelyn E. Smith Originally published in Fantastic Universe, September 1955 Narrated by Tom Trissel It is my theory, Professor Falabella said, helping himself to a cookie, that no one ever really makes a decision. What really happens is that whenever alternative courses of action are called for, the individuality splits up and continues on two or more divergent planes, very much like the parthenogenesis of a unicellular animal. Delicious cookies, these, Mrs. Hughes. Thank you, Professor, Gloria simpered. I made them myself. You must give us the recipe, said one of the ladies, and the others murmured agreement, glad to get their individualities on a plane they could understand. Since most decisions are hardly as momentous as the individual imagines, Professor Falabella continued, and since the imagination of the average individual is very limited, many of these different planes, or as they are colloquially known, space-time continuums, may exist in close, even tangential relationship. Gloria rose unobtrusively and took the teapot to the kitchen for a refill. Her husband stood by the sink, moodily drinking whisky out of the bottle, so as to avoid having to wash a glass afterward. "'Bill, you're not being polite to our guests. Why don't you go out and listen to Professor Falabella?' "'I can hear him perfectly well from here,' Bill muttered. And indeed, the Professor's mellifluous tones pervaded every nook and cranny of the thin-walled house. "'Long-winded cultist!' What is he a professor of, I'd like to know? Professor Falabella is not a cultist, affirmed Gloria angrily. He's a great philosopher. Bill Hughes said something unprintable. If I'd married Lucy Allison, he continued unkindly, she'd never have filled the house with long-haired cultists on my so-called day of rest. Gloria's soft chin trembled, and her blue eyes filled with tears. She was beginning to put on weight, he noticed. "'I've been hearing nothing but Lucy Allison, Lucy Allison, Lucy Allison for the past year. You, you said yourself she looked like a horse.' "'Horses,' he observed, "'have sense.' He was being brutal, but he couldn't help it, and didn't want to. Professor Falabella was only the most long-winded of a long series of mystics Gloria was forever dragging into the house. The trouble with the half-educated, he thought bitterly, is that they seek culture in the most peculiar places. I'll bet she would have let me have peace on Sunday, he said. It just goes to show what happens when you marry a woman solely for her looks. He drained the bottle, then hurled it into the garbage pail with a resounding crash. Gloria's shoulders shook as she filled the kettle. I wish I decided to be an old maid, she sobbed. A very unlikely possibility, he thought. Even now, shop-worn as she was, Gloria could have fairly wide range of suitors should something happen to him. She looked sexy, but how deceiving appearances could be. Professor Falabella was still talking as Bill and Gloria emerged from the kitchen. I believe that it is possible for an individual who exists on a limited plane of imagination to transpose from one plane to an adjacent one without difficulty. 
Great heavens, what was that? Something had whisked past the archway leading to the foyer. Don't pay any attention, Gloria smiled nervously. The house is haunted. My dear, one of the ladies offered, I know the most marvellous exterminator. The house, Gloria assured her coldly, really is haunted. We've been seeing things ever since we moved in. And she really believed it, Bill thought. Believed that the house was haunted, that is. Of course he had seen things too. But he was enlightened enough to know that ghosts don't exist, even if you do see them. Professor Falabella cleared his throat. As I was saying, it is possible to send the individual through another, well, dimension, as some popular writers would have it, to one of his other spatial existences on the same temporal plane. It is merely necessary for him to find the door. Nonsense, Bill interrupted. Holy unmitigated nonsense! Every head swivelled to look at him. Gloria restrained tears with an effort. Brute, someone muttered. But ridicule apparently only stimulated the professor. He beamed. You don't believe me. Your imagination cannot extend to the comprehension of the multifariousness of space. Nonsense, Bill said again, but less confidently. I believe that I have discovered the doorway, Professor Falabella continued, and the way is open. However, most people fear to penetrate the unknown, even though it is to enter another phase of their own existence. I do admit that the shock of spatial transference, no matter how slight, combined with the concrete awareness of a previous spatial relationship, would be perhaps too much for the keenly sensitive individualism. Bill opened his mouth. I know what you're about to say, young man. You don't have to be a mind-reader to know that, Bill assured him. His consonants were already a little slurred, and he knew Gloria was ashamed of him. It served her right. He'd been ashamed of her for years. Professor Falabella smiled. His teeth were very sharp and white. Very well, Mr. Hughes. Since you are a sceptic, perhaps you will not object to being the subject of our experiment yourself. What kind of an experiment? Bill asked suspiciously. Merely to go through the door. Any door can become the doorway if it is transposed into the proper spatial dimension. That door, for instance. Professor Falabella waved his hand toward the doorway of what Gloria liked to call Bill's study. You mean you just want me to open the door and go into that room? Bill asked incredulously. That's all. That is all. Of course. You go with the awareness that it is the threshold of another plane, and that you will step voluntarily from this existence to an adjacent one. Sure, Bill said. He had just remembered there was a nearly full bottle of Calvert in the bottom drawer of the desk. Sure, anything to oblige. Very well, go to the door, and keep remembering that your own free will you are passing from this plane to the next. Look out, everybody! Bill called raucously as he pulled open the door. I'm coming in on the next plane. No one laughed. He stepped over the threshold, shutting the door firmly behind him. A wonderful excuse to get away from those blasted women. He'd climb out of the window as soon as he'd collected the whiskey and give them a nervous moment thinking he'd really passed into another existence. It would serve Gloria right. For a moment, as he crossed, he had a queer sensation. Maybe there was something in what Professor Falabella said. But no, there he was in the study. All that mumbo-jumbo was getting him down, that was all. He was a nervous man, only nobody appreciated the fact. Taking a cigarette out of the pack in his pocket, he reached for the lighter on his desk. It wasn't there. Time and time again he'd told Gloria not to touch his things, and always she'd disobeyed him. Company was coming and she must tidy up, cooking and cleaning, 
That was all she was good for. But this was carrying tidiness too far. She'd even removed the ashtrays. And where did that glass block paperweight come from? He'd had a penguin in a snowstorm, and he'd been happy with it. This was too much. He'd tell Gloria off stealing a man's penguin. He opened the door into the living room and bumped into Lucy Allison. "'Don't you think you've been in there long enough, Bill?' she asked acridly. "'I'm sure your guests would appreciate catching a glimpse of you.' But "'Why, hello, Lucy,' he said, surprised. "'I didn't know Gloria had invited you.' "'Gloria, Gloria, Gloria!' Lucy cut across his sentence. "'You've been talking about nothing but that dumb little blonde for months.' Because of the people in the room beyond, her voice was pitched low, but her pale eyes glittered unpleasantly behind her spectacles. "'I wish you had married her. You'd have made a fine pair.' Gently, caressingly, the short hairs on the back of Bill's neck rose. "'Come back in here,' Lucy said, hauling him back into the living room where a number of people who had been enjoying the domestic fracas suddenly broke into loud and animated chatter. "'Dr. Hildebrand was telling us all about nuclear fission.' "'Can't find an ashtray,' Bill muttered, seizing on something tangible. "'Can't find an ashtray in the whole darn place.' "'We've been over this millions of times, Bill. You know,' she smiled at the guests, a smile that carefully excluded Bill. "'I'm allergic to smoke, but I never can get my husband to remember he isn't to smoke inside the house.' "'Now take the neutron, for example,' Dr. Hildebrand said through a mouthful of pâté. "'What is the neutron? It is only—' "'What was that?' The wraith of Gloria crossed the foyer and disappeared. Bill took a step forward, then stood still. Lucy smiled self-consciously. "'That's nothing at all. The house is merely haunted.' Everyone laughed. "'Forgot something,' Bill muttered and dashed back into the study. He yanked open the bottom drawer of the desk. Sure enough, there was a bottle of Shenley, nearly a third full. There are some advantages, he thought as he tilted it to his lips, in having a limited imagination. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Back to Julie, by Richard Wilson, originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, May 1954. Narrated by Tom Trussell. You can't go shooting off to that dimension for peanuts. I don't want to give you the impression that peanuts are in short supply here, or that our economy is in the fix of having to import them sidewise. What I'm trying to convey is that if you're one of the rare ones functionally equipped to do the side shuffle, you ought to be well paid for it, in any coin. That's what I told Krasnow, and he wasn't after peanuts. I'll do it, I said, if you'll make it worth my while. I'd hardly expect you to do it for nothing, he replied reproachfully. How much do you want? I told him. The amount shook him up, but only briefly. OK, he said grudgingly. I suppose I'll have to give it to you. But the stuff had better be good. Oh, it is, I assured him. And you don't have to be afraid, because I couldn't possibly skip with the loot. I'll have to travel naked. I can't get there with so much as a sandal on one foot or a filling in a single tooth. Fortunately, my teeth are perfect. Sweat poured off Krasnow's florid face as he worked the combination of his office safe. His fat jowls quivered unhappily around his cigar while he counted out the bills. Ten per cent was cash in advance, and the rest went into a bank account in my name. I paid off a batch of bills, then stripped and did my off to Buffalo. Honours to John Krasnow was a crooked district attorney who wanted to be governor and then president. He had the machine, but he didn't have the people. And because he needed the people, he needed me. I had been to this other dimension, the one on the farthest branch of the time tree, and I could give him what he wanted. Krasnow found out about it, 
after I was hauled up in front of him on a check-kiting charge. I'd had something of a reputation before I got into difficulties, and, in trying to live up to the reputation, I had done some plain and fancy financing. Nothing that fifteen to twenty grand wouldn't have fixed, but while I scrounged around, trying to get cash, I kited a few checks. They pyramided me right into the DA's office, where Krasnow was probably sympathetic. How? he asked. Could a man of your standing in the scientific world stoop so low? It developed into quite a lecture, and even coming from Krasnow, it made me feel pretty low. So I began explaining. I told him where I was born, and where I went to school, and where I had taken my sabbaticals, including this other dimension. And Krasnow believed me. I can't account for it, except possibly because he knew he was a crook, and I knew I wasn't one, exactly. Anyway, he believed me, and we made the deal, and I did the side shuffle, as agreed. The journey to that other dimension is not a pleasant one. It does disturbing things to the stomach, and you see everything thin and elongated, as if you're sitting too far to the side in a movie theatre. I got there, however, and waited for the hiccups to subside. Hiccupi laterali, I had called them when I considered writing an article for the medical journal after my first trip. With the hiccupi gone, I stole some clothing, which was one of the riskiest parts of the programme, and waited for morning. I didn't have any money, of course, so I had to hitchhike into town. I could have stolen myself a better fit, but people aren't clothes-conscious in that dimension. They're more interested in what you are and what you can do. The driver of the car that gave me a lift asked, And what is your field of endeavour? I told him, I am able to eliminate the long wait in ivory production by accelerating the growth cycle of elephants. He was deeply impressed and tipped me handsomely. I was less impressed with his talent for growing cobless corn, and therefore had to return only a small part of the sum he gave me. The world of this dimension had developed some remarkable parallels to Earth. I mean our Earth, which falls into what I have called designated Timeline 1.1, since it's the Earth with which I am most familiar. Every other world that has a language calls itself Earth 2, I had to visit briefly hundreds of the lateral worlds, hovering over primordial swamps, limitless oceans, insect kingdoms and radioactive planetoids, before I found the one that was truly parallel. It existed in Timeline 17.08, and it had refrigerators, platinum blondes, automobiles, airplanes, apple pie, tabloids, television, scotch and soda, just about everything we think makes life worthwhile. But it had its little differences, which was only to be expected in a timeline where the bionomics would create a new world each time someone changed his mind. Thus, the cobbler's corn man was driving what looked to me like a Chevrolet, but which was a Morton in his world. He let me off near a downtown restaurant where, thanks to a little exchange of talent talk, I had enough money for breakfast. It was considered unethical to swap talent talk outside the limits of certain rigidly defined groups, so I didn't try to out-impress the waitress. Fed, and feeling my stolen clothes a bit better, I walked to the recorder's office and spent the rest of the morning looking up old documents. There was nothing there for Krasnow, as I had expected. But for me there was a very pretty file clerk. Talking to her, I verified my impression that human instincts and relationships were much the same in this dimension as in my own, except in the one basic respect that interested Krasnow, of course. The file clerk and I lunched together, and then I spent the afternoon in the library. But I didn't find anything there either, and then I had dinner with her. She said her name was Julie. I told her mine was Heck, for Hector, which it is. She thought this was awfully cute, and we got along fine. 
Julie had a delightful apartment and a matching sense of hospitality. The following day, when she went to work, I stayed home and washed the dishes and made the bed and used the telephone. I ran up quite a bill with my long-distance calls, but I found out what I needed to know. I impressed a lot of people with my elephant story, and pretended to be impressed hardly at all with what they told me they did, although often I was very much. The trouble with these people is that they no longer know how to lie, if that can be listed as trouble. I don't think it can. Neither did Krasnow, obviously. He'd never have sent me off on my expensive side-trip if he had. Of course, Krasnow looked at it objectively. What he wanted from Timeline 17.08 was not for himself. It was for everybody else. He wanted the formula for the truth gas these people had developed long ago and loosed upon their world to put a stop to wars. They had been in a bad way although no worse than the sort of problem we were up against. Their trans-ocean squabbles and power politics seemed to have settled into a pattern of a war or two per generation, just like us. Hence, the man who invented the truth gas became a global hero, after a certain amount of cynicism and scepticism. All the doubts vanished naturally once the gas got to working, and so did war. You can't do much plotting and scheming if, every time you open your mouth to tell a lie, you stammer, sweat, turn red, and gasp for breath. It's a dead giveaway. Nobody tries it more than once. One or two men had tried to nullify the gas or work out a local antidote, either as a pure research project or through power madness. But because they had to state their purposes as soon as they thought of them, they were put away. Neat. Very neat. What I wanted was a formula for the truth gas. Its location wasn't exactly a secret in this land of complete candour, but it wasn't writ large on any wall for all to see either. They kept it in the capital, located about where our Omaha is, on file among the vital statistics. I took a superjet out there. I had no trouble posing as a historian entitled to the facts. The gas didn't work on me, you see, because it was adjusted to the physiology of that timeline. There was just enough difference between us for it not to make me stick to the truth. We'll write out the formula for you, I was told obligingly, but you'll have to sign the usual statement. Of course, I said, which one is that? The one that says you won't publish it, and will destroy your copy when it has served your research purpose without letting anyone else see it. Oh, that statement, I said. I signed freely, told my elephant story, and departed in an aura of good will. The jet got me back that same evening. Julie fixed me up a snack, and we discussed how pretty she was and how nice I was. I had everything Krasnow wanted now. I felt pretty good about it, because there was nobody else who could have done the job for him, and because it wasn't spying, really. Earth 1.1 on the timeline is world enough for Krasnow, I'm sure. Besides, dimensions don't have wars with one another. Too many things can go wrong. Julie was lovely, and I hated to leave the next morning, but it was my job. I told her, I'm afraid I have to leave town for a bit, dear, but I'll be back very soon. Business, you know. Being a 17.08 girl, Julie had no reason to doubt me. Make it very soon, she whispered, her lips close to my ear. So I came back, and now Krasnow has what he wants. He is delighted, as he should be. I've made up the gas for him, and adjusted the formula so that it will work on people of our timeline. It's high-power stuff, and a little will go a long way. I also made up an antidote for him. This was easy, since I could work on it without feeling any compulsion to tell everybody what I was doing, and why. Krasnow plans to release the truth gas just before the state convention. He'll be nominated, of course, and after November— He'll be governor. 
with everyone else compelled to tell the truth, it should be a cinch for him. He is a patient man, honest John Krasnow is, and is willing to wait four years for the presidency. I ought to be happy, too. With the money Krasnow gave me, I have been living in the style to which I have always wanted to be accustomed. He has offered me a place on his staff, and somewhat superfluously the use of his antidote. Naturally, the reason he was so magnanimous was that he doesn't want anyone else around who knows his gimmick and might have to tell the truth about it. But I have had enough of this dimension now, now that Krasnow has what I promised him. He's going to use it tomorrow, and if I know honest John, and I do, not even the presidency will be big enough for him. So I am going back to Julie. There are some obvious questions in your mind, I know, such as, why did I get the formula for Krasnow, knowing there was no way for him to prosecute me while I was in Julie's dimension, and what made me come back? In short, what was in it for me? Let's call it research. Krasnow is a big-time operator. I've always been, you might say, in the peanut end of the game. He had a great deal to teach me, and I, I'm happy to say, was an apt pupil. You might speculate on what's in it for you, because, if you asked me, anybody who can do the side shuffle would do it before Krasnow becomes president. However, don't go to 17.08 unless you want to swap one Krasnow for another. The fact is that I've learned I can be one in Julie's dimension. After all, their formula doesn't work on me, but I can assure you that it will work on you. And that elephant story I told on my last visit is, as I've indicated, in the peanut category. All Krasnow has is a country. I'll have a whole world. There's nothing like study under a master, is there? I should be back to Julie by midnight, if I start now. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Hitch in Time by Frederick Pohl Writing as James McCree, originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, June 1947. Narrated by Tom Trissel. Obviously, the man was dying, and there was no chance that he ever would be discovered. I blessed the carelessness that had caused me to set the space-time dials a little off when I began this journey to the distant past. I had come to this barbaric era in the proper time, indeed, but millions of miles removed from it in space. It had been only after an annoying search that I had discovered Earth, jetted toward it in my space-drive suit, and had come down out of the skies to land on this tiny deserted island in the middle of an empty sea. But it was incredible luck that had brought me there, for I had found exactly what I needed, a man who would give me information, clothing, and an identity, and then die and obliterate the record of my interference with the course of events. I... Thom Ra walked toward him, feeble though he was. He opened his eyes and stared at me. Thank heaven, he whispered, in the thick, hideous language of that era. I couldn't have lasted much longer if you hadn't found me. He fell back and smiled at me with heartfelt gratitude, and for a moment I felt a wild, fleeting impulse to help him, to save his life. But of course I dared not interfere for that would change the shape of the future, and that meant destruction for me. When I blasted off from the island a little later, he was dead, and I was wearing his uniform and his name. He gave me information before he died, and I had no trouble locating the spot I wanted. 
I waited till dark before landing a few hundred yards from the war dome. Then I hid my space drive suit in a cluster of ancient trees and walked into the building that housed the most murderous weapon of all time. The sentry challenged me, of course, but I was ready for him. After a quick look at my stolen credentials, he sheathed his ray pistol. Pass, sir, he said, and I walked in, no longer as Thom Ra, but identified as Captain San Requa of the Intelligence Service. At once I saw the atom rocket. It was on the other side of the great chamber, nestled in a wheeled cradle, ready to be rolled out to the blast-off point. Hurrying technicians swarmed about it with the last-minute checks. I walked over, saluted the officer who was supervising, and began to witness events which I had crossed so tremendous a span of years to observe. The atom rocket was a long silvery torpedo, a cluster of tubes at the rear, a snub-nosed warhead at the front. A panel in the side of it was open, and technicians were setting dials according to the figures read off by a white-haired old officer with the insignia of a general on his collar. I listened in awe and reverence, straining to note and remember everything that occurred. To think that I was actually present at the climactic moment of the legendary War of Annihilation. It was the most thrilling moment of my life. Almost I forgot to curse Master Lees and his duplicity as I watched. Almost, but not quite. For the thing was too fresh in my mind, and I was aware that I was still in danger. It had begun with a routine notice that my preparatory work had been approved and that I was authorised to enter a theme in ortho-history for my final citizenship ratings. The theme I saw with a sinking heart was the War of Annihilation. I had hurried to Master Liss, my instructor, sure that there was an error. Master, you give me an impossible task, I had said. The theme regulations are that I must make a real and complete contribution to human knowledge. But how can I? We have so pitifully few records of the War of Annihilation. All of them have been studied and analysed and worked over for thousands of years. There's no way for me to add to what has been written already. He cackled at me in his insufferable tri-alpha way. There is a way, he mumbled, peeping at me out of his roomy old eyes. It took me a moment to realise what he meant. The time belts! And Master Liss nodded. While I argued with him, of course, the time belts were too dangerous. Not one time traveller in ten returned from the past, even when their projects were as recent as a hundred years ago. And the farther into the past one ventured, the more certain it became that return would be impossible. For although the mechanism of the time belts could be trusted, and there was no physical menace that the conductor screens or the catenated guns could not cope with, there was the ever-present danger of fan-shaped time itself. It was the first law of chronistics. Our era is a product of everything that occurred in the past. Should anything in the past be changed, our age would also be changed. Oh, it would continue to exist, but in a parallel branch of time. And there was no way of passing from one branch to another. And if a traveller into the past should interfere in the course of events, he would be bound to the new time stream his actions created, and the unlucky traveller would never be able to return. The branches of fan-shaped time could never be retraced. The man who interfered with the space-time matrix, displacing even a comma in the great scroll of time, would be cut off from his origin forever. The danger was too great. I refused to accept the assignment, 
even though I knew it would mean I would never rise to the status of tri-alpha citizenship, which was otherwise my right. Then I heard about Elrin, lovely, adored Elrin Dree, and I could no longer refuse. For Elrin's mating indices were posted, and she was a tri-alpha herself. Then I understood what had been in Master Lys's mind when it set that impossible task for me. For I knew that the gnarled, worm-eaten old wreck had dared to covet my Elrin. Loving me, she could never be his. But with me out of the way, he might have a chance. I accepted the assignment. Master Lys secured a time belt for me. He was willing enough to help at my execution, and I began my perilous journey through time. I came back to my surroundings with a start. Something was wrong. Subconsciously I had been studying the atom rocket, and now I was jolted out of my reveries as I realised that it did not look as it should have. The author of history books were clear on one fact. Venus had been destroyed in the War of Annihilation by means of a hydrogen chain reaction, the most deadly atom blast known. Atoms of hydrogen, under the influence of gamma particle bombardment, coalesced to form atoms of helium, and all the incalculable power represented by the odd fraction of mass left over was released in the form of free energy. But the atom rocket before me seemed to be nothing more than a simple nuclear fission affair. Where were the photon exciters, the gamma-ray bombardment equipment? Of course, even a fission bomb could do a good deal of local damage, as shown in the first atom-bombed cities during the little wars of the early twentieth centuries. But unless our nuclear science was in error, it could not set off a chain reaction of the type that had destroyed the Venusian colonies. Was I in the wrong place? Alarmed, I shoved my wave closer to the rocket, staring at it. It was a crude, primitive affair, of course, and it was hard for me to identify its parts. I examined it with frantic curiosity, and abruptly I found myself in peril. One of the technicians I had pushed aside was staring at me, eyes filled with suspicion. I caught his gaze and cursed myself for having acted so rashly. Desperately, I strove to think of a way to allay his suspicions, but it was too late. "'What are you doing?' the technician demanded. "'Who are you?' I tried to conciliate him. "'Captain Sanrek was my name,' I said, using the name on the stolen identity papers. "'I am.' But I got no farther than that. My accent gave me away. "'He's a spy!' roared the technician. "'Help!' And a dozen ray pistols flashed out of the holsters as the men around us were galvanised into action. I lost my head. Terrified, I grabbed for the safety belt concealed beneath my stolen tunic, touched the button that controlled my conductor screen. The screen shimmered into instant life, and not a moment too soon. Rays from the weapons pointed at me flashed from all sides, sparked against the opalescent curtain of the screen, and were dissipated. I was safe, but only for an instant. For I had made my second great mistake. I was too close to the atom rocket. My conductor screen grazed the warhead itself. Its energies surged through the unstable elements in the warhead. A warning bell sprang into clamorous life. The group around me froze in their tracks, mouths open, faces mirroring fright and disbelief, and the frightful power of the strained atoms within the warhead began to grind toward nuclear fission. There was only one thing to do, and the poor choice it was. But in a moment the warhead would explode, and of me and my mission, and the whole future of Earth, nothing would be left but a puff of fiery vapour. Quickly I dropped the shield off my conductor screen, trusting that my luck would hold, and the men around me were too dazed to fire the weapons again. I drew my catenator, set it at drain, focused it on the atomic warhead. The twin violet beams sprang out and impinged on the silvery metal. P 
pierced it and sucked the heart from the seething mass of erupting matter within. Blinding energies were drawn from those toppling atomic structures, surging through the carrier beam of the catenator into the photon pack cartridges at my waist. I had an instant's fear as I wondered if the storage pack would hold all the mighty energies of the warhead, far greater than the maximum load for which it was designed. But lightnings of static electricity played around my head, dissipating brilliantly but harmlessly into the air, and in an instant the danger was over. The bursting energies of the warhead had been drawn out, and the mass of matter inside it was inert. Before me lay the atom rocket, harmless, dead. I had destroyed Earth's most potent weapon. I give those ancients credit for bravery. Dangerous though I must have seemed, they closed in on me without firing their weapons. Meekly I raised my arms over my head. The white-haired general blazed hatred at me from his pale eyes. "'Who are you?' he demanded. I shrugged. Carefully I phrased my words in their outlandish tongue. "'I am a, a visitor from the future,' I said. "'I regret the accident that just happened more than I can say.' "'Regret it?' he blazed. "'Ha! You'll regret it twice as much when you face the firing squad.' I spread my hands helplessly. In truth, death had no terrors for me now. A firing squad would seem almost a blessing, for I had destroyed the bomb that would have blasted Venus. Whatever happened now, the future before me was changed, and in a changed future I had no place, and my Elrun would not exist. "'Take him out and shoot him!' the general cried. I turned to go to my death, almost eagerly. In my heart I whispered, "'Elrun! Elrun, my lost love!' The technician who had unmasked me interfered. "'Wait!' he begged. "'Let me question him, sir. Perhaps he's telling the truth.' The general glowered. What's the difference? He's wrecked the bomb. But he hesitated and finally said, All right, question him. The harm's done anyhow. Sunk in despair, I scarcely heard the other officer's sharp queries. But he was hesitant, and I told him whence I had come, and why. He looked at me incredulously. But the bomb, he demanded, what do you do to it? I patted the photon pack cartridges strung along my belt. I had to drain it, I said. It was about to explode. Drain it? How? With a catenator. I explained to him how the energies of the exploding atoms were drawn off through the catenator beams and trapped in the photon pack. He stared at the tiny power cells, eyes wide but showing a sudden glint of hope. Can you take that energy out again and send it into another object? You mean to energize the atom bomb again? I said. No, of course not. He was shaking his head. I mean something else, he said. Can you send them across fifty million miles of space? I stared at him, fascinated and afraid. I dare not interfere, I whispered. But you have interfered, he yelled. You wrecked our chance to win this war. You've got to help us. I stepped back, bewildered. What he said was true enough. Yet all my training, all the warnings of Elrin and Master Lys said over and over, you must not interfere. Yet I had interfered already. I had started a new time sequence by destroying Earth's chance to wipe out Venus. If I could neutralize that act by helping them now, perhaps there would be a chance. I will show you how to use the catenator, I said weakly. Silently I adjusted it, 
slipped the belt off and handed it to him. He led me outside to where stars blazed in a black night. He looked upward hesitantly, pointed to a brilliant blue planet. "'Is that it?' he asked one of his companions. The man nodded. Carefully he took aim, pressed the trigger as I had showed him. Lightnings roared again. The twin violet beams leaped from the muzzle of the weapon, howled up into the heavens. In a fraction of a second the photon pack was drained, and the pyrotechnic display died away. All was silent. One of the officers raced into the building, pounded the keys of a calculator. He returned almost at once. At this distance it will take just under nine minutes for light to make the round trip, he said. The officer who had fired the catenator whirled to confront me. "'Suppose I missed!' he cried in sudden alarm. "'It is so far. A fraction of a second of arc would make the beam miss entirely.' I shook my head. "'The beam fans out,' I explained. "'And a planet has mass, and the photons are attracted to gravity. Even if, if they should miss, the attraction of the planet would draw them into it.' He nodded and was silent. Silence cloaked us all, a hundred ancients and myself, all staring up into a mysterious night. Nine minutes passed as slowly as nine terrible years, but by and by the hands of my chronometer completed their revolutions. Suddenly we saw the catenator beam strike. Above us, a new sun blazed forth, kindling like the striking of a cosmic match. Night fled around us, and day came flaring up into noonday brilliance and beyond. Heat poured down upon us, brilliant rays of sunlight more intense than I had ever seen. The dome behind me sparkled and glistened in the incredible radiations from the stricken planet millions of miles away and for a moment I could almost feel the fierce cynic waves of ultraviolet cosmics and a thousand other superspectral radiations. Then the peak was reached, and the light began to fade as all the hydrogen was transmuted and consumed. In a moment the flare of energies was gone, and the pale blue planet had become a glowing orange coal. We had seen a billion persons dying in a planetary settee. The vastness of the dead stunned me. I found that I was stopping, almost weeping as I felt myself stained with a cosmic guilt. The officer who had destroyed a billion lives glanced at me in full understanding of what he had done. He placed a hand on my shoulder strangely comforting. It couldn't be helped, he said in a voice that surged with emotion. I nodded bleakly. It couldn't be helped. It was for the sake of Earth, I said, blindly seeking justification. Earth was destined to win in my time sequence, and I had interfered. I had to correct the consequences of my blunder. I stopped. Wild astonishment burst through the tragic mask on the face of the officer. He drew back his arm as though he had found himself embracing an adder. "'What's the matter?' I asked in astonishment. He stared at me with dawning comprehension and pity. "'Say that again,' he whispered. "'Why, I said I had to correct my mistake.' I had interfered, and the time-traveller who interferes maroons himself hopelessly. I had destroyed your weapon against Venus, yet Venus had to be obliterated, or else I had no chance of return. I was lost, and now, perhaps, I may have a chance to get back." He shook his head. There was compassion in his voice. No, 
You have no chance, he said, and hesitated while I tried to take in his meaning. You see, this is Venus, he waved at the glowing cinder in the sky. That was Earth up there. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Never Meet Again by Algis Budris Originally published in Infinity, March 1958 Narrated by Tom Trisser The breeze soughed through the linden trees. It was warm and gentle as it drifted along the boulevard. It tugged at the dresses of the girls strolling with their young men, and stirred their modishly cut hair. It set the banners atop the government buildings to flapping, and it brought with it the sound of a jet aircraft, a Heinkel or a Messerschmitt, rising into the sky from Tempelhof Aerodrome. But when it touched Professor Kempfer on his bench, it brought him only the scent of the Parisian perfumes and the sight of gaily coloured frocks swaying around the girl's long, healthy legs. Dr. Professor Kempfer straightened his exhausted shoulders and raised his heavy head. His deep, strained eyes struggled to break through their now habitual dull stare. It was spring again, he realised in faint surprise. The pretty girls were eating their lunches hastily once more, so that they and their young men could stroll along Unter and Linden, and the young men in the broad-shouldered jackets were clear-eyed and full of their own awakening strength. And, of course, Professor Kempfer wore no overcoat today. He was not quite the comic pedant who wore his galoshes in the sunshine. It was only that he had forgotten, for the moment. The strain of these last few days had been very great. All these months, these years, he had been doing his government-subsidised research, and the other thing too, four or five hours for the government, and then a full day on the much more important thing no one knew about. Twelve, sixteen hours a day. Home to his very nice government apartment, where Frau Ritter, the housekeeper, had his supper ready. The supper eaten, to bed and in the morning, cocoa, a bit of pastry, and to work. At noon he would leave his laboratory for a little while to come here and eat the slice of black bread and cheese Frau Ritter had wrapped in waxed paper and put in his pocket before he left the house. But it was over now. Not the government sinecure. That was just made work for the old savant who, after all, held the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his work with the anti-submarine radar detector. That, of course, had been fifteen years ago. If they could not quite pension him off, still no one expected anything of a feeble old man puttering around the apparatus they had given him to play with. And they were right, of course. Nothing would ever come of it. But the other thing— that was done now. After this last little rest, he would go back to his laboratory in the Himmlerstrasse and take the final step. So now he could let himself relax and feel the warmth of the sun. Professor Kempfer smiled wearily at the sunshine. The good, constant sun, he thought, that gives of itself to all of us, no matter who or where we are. Spring. April. 1958. Had it really been fifteen years? And sixteen years since the end of the war? It didn't seem possible. But then one day had been exactly like another for him, with only an electric light in the basement where his real apparatus was, an electric light that never told him whether it was morning, moon, or night. I have become a cave dweller, he thought with sudden realization. I have forgotten to think in terms of serial time. 
What an odd little trick I have played on myself. Had he really been coming here, to this bench, every clear day for fifteen years? Impossible. But— He counted on his fingers. 1940 was the year England had surrendered, with its air force destroyed and the Luftwaffe flying unchallenged air cover for the swift invasion. He had been sent to England late that year to supervise the shipment home of the ultra-short wavelength radar from the Royal Navy's anti-submarine warfare school, and 1941 was the year the U-boats took firm control of the Atlantic. 1942 was the year the Russians lost at Stalingrad, starved by the millions, and surrendered to a Wehrmacht fed on shiploads of Argentinian beef. 1942 was the end of the war. Yes. So it had been that long. I have become an indrawn old man, he thought to himself in bemusement, so very busy with myself. And the world has gone by, even while I sat here, and might have watched it, if I had taken the trouble. The world— he took the sandwich from his coat pocket, unwrapped it, and began to eat. But after the first few bites he forgot it, and held it in one hand while he stared sightlessly in front of him. His pale, mobile lips fell into a wry smile. The world, the vigorous young world, so full of strength, so confident, while I worked in my cellar like some Bolshevik dreaming of a fantastic bomb that would wipe out all my enemies at a stroke. But what I have is not a bomb, and I have no enemies. I am an honoured citizen of the greatest empire the world has ever known. Hitler is thirteen years dead in his auto-accident, and the new Chancellor is a different sort of man. He has promised us no war with the Americans. We have peace, and triumph, and these create a different sort of atmosphere than do war and desperation. We have relaxed now. We have the fruit of our victory. What do we not have in our empire of a thousand years? Western civilization is safe at last from the hordes of the East. Our future is assured. There is nothing, no one to fight, and these young people walking here have never known a moment's doubt, an instant's question of their place in an endlessly bright to-morrow. I will soon die, and the rest of us who know the old days will die soon enough. It will all belong to the young people, all this eternal world. It belongs to them already. It's just that some of us old ones have not yet gotten altogether out of the way. He stared out at the strolling crowds. How many years can I possibly have left to me? Three? Two? Four? I could die to-morrow. He sat absolutely still for a moment, listening to the thick old blood slurring through his veins, to the thready flutter of his heart. It hurt his eyes to see. It hurt his throat to breathe. The skin of his hands was like spotted old paper. Fifteen years of work, fifteen years in his cellar, building what he had built. For what? Was his apparatus going to change anything? Would it detract even one trifle from this empire? Would it alter the life of even one citizen in that golden tomorrow? This world would go on exactly as it was. Nothing would change in the least. So what had he worked for? For himself? For this outworn husk of one man? Seen in that light, he looked like a very stupid man. Stupid. Foolish. Monomaniacal. Dear God, he thought with a rush of terrible intensity, am I now going to persuade myself not to use what I have built? For all these years he had worked, worked without stopping, without thinking. Now, in this first hour of rest, was he suddenly going to spit on it all? A stout bulk settled on the bench beside him. 
Joachim, the complacent voice said. Professor Kempfer looked up. Ah, George, he said with an embarrassed laugh, you startled me. Dr. Professor George Tansler guffawed heartily. Oh, Joachim, Joachim, he chuckled, shaking his head. What a type you are! A thousand times I've found you here at noon, and each time it seems as if it surprises you. What do you think about here on your bench? Professor Kempfer let his eyes stray. Oh, I don't know, he said gently. I look at the young people. The girls! Tansler's elbow dug roguishly into his side. The girls, eh, Joachim? A veil drew over Professor Kempfer's eyes. No, he whispered. Not like that. No. What, then? Nothing, Professor Kempfer said dully. I look at nothing. Tansler's mood changed instantly. So, he declared with precision, I thought as much. Everyone knows you are working night and day, even though there is no need for it. Tansler resurrected a chuckle. We are not in any great hurry now. It is not as if we were pressed by anyone. The Australians and Canadians are fenced off by our navy. The Americans have their hands full in Asia. And your project, whatever it may be, will help no one if you kill yourself with overwork. You know there is no project, Professor Kempfer whispered. You know it is all just busy work. No one reads my reports. No one checks my results. They give me the equipment I ask for, and do not mind as long as it is not too much. You know that quite well. Why pretend otherwise? Tansler sucked his lips. Then he shrugged. Well, if you realize, then you realize, he said cheerfully. Then he changed expression again, and laid his hand on Professor Kempfer's arm in comradely fashion. Joachim, it has been fifteen years. Must you still try to bury yourself? Sixteen, Professor Kempfer corrected, and then realized Tansler was not thinking of the end of the war. Sixteen years since then, yes, but fifteen since Martha died. Only fifteen? I must learn to think in terms of serial time again. He realized Tansler was waiting for a response, and mustered a shrug. Joachim, have you been listening to me? Listening? Of course, George. Of course, Tansler snorted, his moustaches fluttering. Joachim, he said positively, it is not as if we were young men, I admit, but life goes on, even for us old crocs. Tansler was a good five years Kempfer's junior. We must look ahead. We must live for a future. We cannot let ourselves sink into the past. I realize you were very fond of Martha. Every man is fond of his wife. That goes without saying. But fifteen years, Joachim, surely it is proper to grieve, but to mourn like this. This is not healthy. One bright spark singed through the quiet barriers Professor Kempfer had thought perfect. Were you ever in a camp, George? he demanded, shaking with pent-up violence. A camp? Tansler was taken aback. I, of course not, Joachim, but, but you and Martha were not in a real lager. It was just a, a, you were under the state's protection, after all, Joachim. Professor Kempfer said stubbornly, but Martha died under the state's protection. Well, these things happen, Joachim. After all, you're a reasonable man. Martha, tuberculosis, even sulphur has its limitations. That might have happened to anyone. She did not have tuberculosis in 1939 when we were placed under the state's protection. And when I finally said yes, I would go to work for them, and they gave me the radar detector to work on, they promised me it was only a little congestion in her bronchi, and that it was soon as she was well they would bring her home. And the war ended, and they did not bring her home. I was given the Knight's Cross from Hitler's hands personally, but they did not bring her home. And the last time I went to the sanitarium to see her, she was dead. And they paid for it all, and gave me my laboratory here, and an apartment, and clothes, and food, and a very good housekeeper. But Martha was dead. Fifteen years, Joachim, have you not forgiven us? No. For a little while today, just a little while ago, 
I thought I might, but no. Tanzler puffed out his lips and fluttered them with an exhaled breath. So, he said, what are you going to do to us for it? Professor Kempfer shook his head. To you? What should I do to you? The men who arranged these things are all dead or dying. If I had some means of hurting the Reich, and I do not, how could I revenge myself on these children? He looked towards the passers-by. What am I to them, or they to me? No, no, I am going to do nothing to you. Tanzler raised his eyebrows and put his thick fingertips together. If you are going to do nothing to us, then what are you going to do to yourself? I am going to go away. Already Professor Kempfer was ashamed of his outburst. He felt he had controverted his essential character. A man of science, after all, a thinking, reasoning man, could not let himself descend to emotional levels. Professor Kempfer was embarrassed to think that Tanzler might believe this sort of lapse was typical of him. "'Who am I,' he tried to explain, "'to be judge and jury over a whole nation, an empire? "'Who is one man to decide good and evil? "'I look at these youngsters, and I envy them with all my heart. "'To be young, to find all the world arranged in orderly fashion for one special benefit, "'to have been placed on a surfboard, free to ride the crest of the wave forever, "'and never to have to swim at all. "'Who am I, George, who am I?' "'But I do not like it here, so I am going away.' Tansler looked at him enigmatically. "'To Carlsbad, for the radium waters. Very helpful. We'll go together.' He began pawing Professor Kempfer's arm with great heartiness. "'A splendid idea. I'll get the seats reserved on the morning train. We'll have a holiday, eh, Joachim?' "'No,' he struggled to his feet, pulling Tansler's hand away from his arm. "'No!' He staggered when Tansler gave way. He began to walk fast, faster than he had walked in years. He looked over his shoulder and saw Tansler lumbering after him. He began to run. He raised an arm. Taxi! Taxi! He lurched toward the curb while the strolling young people looked at him wide-eyed. He hurried through the ground-floor laboratory, his heart pumping wildly. His eyes were fixed on the plain grey door to the fire stairs, and he fumbled in his trousers' pocket for the key. He stumbled against a bench and sent up Arathus crashing over. At the door he steadied himself and, using both hands, slipped the key into the lock. Once through the door he slammed it shut and locked it again, and listened to the hoarse whistle of his breath in his nostrils. Then down the fire stairs he clattered open-mouthed. Tansler. Tansler would be at a telephone somewhere. Perhaps the state police were out in the streets, in their cars, coming here already. He wrenched open the basement door and locked it behind him in the darkness before he turned on the lights. With his chest aching, he braced himself on widespread feet and looked at the dull sheen of yellow light on the racks of grey metal cabinets. They rose about him like the blocks of a Mayan temple with dials for carvings and pilot lights for jewels, and he moved down the narrow aisle between them, slowly and quietly now, like a last enfeebled acolyte. As he walked he threw switches, and the cabinets began to resonate in chorus. The aisle led him, irrevocably, to the focal point. He read what the dials on the master panel told him, and watched the power demand meter inch into the green. If they think to open the building circuit breakers, if they shoot through the door, if I was wrong! Now there were people hammering on the door. Desperately weary, he depressed the firing switch. There was a galvanic thrum, half pain, half pleasure, as the vibratory rate of his body's atoms was changed by an infinitesimal degree. Then he stood in dank darkness, breathing musty air, while whatever parts of his equipment had been included in the field fell to the floor. Behind him he left nothing. Vital resistors had, by design, 
come with him. The overloaded apparatus in the basement laboratory began to stench and burn under the surge of full power and to sputter in George Tansler's face. The basement he was in was not identical with the one he had left. That could only mean that in this Berlin something serious had happened to at least one building on the Himmlerstrasse. Professor Kempfer searched through the darkness with weary patience until he found a door, and while he searched he considered the thought that some upheaval, man-made or natural, had filled in the ground for dozens of metres above his head, leaving only this one pocket of emptiness into which his apparatus had shunted him. When he finally found the door, he leaned against it for some time, and then he gently eased it open. There was nothing but blackness on the other side, and at his first step he tripped and sprawled on a narrow flight of stairs, bruising a hip badly. He found his footing again. On quivering legs he climbed slowly and as silently as he could, clinging to the harsh, newly sawed wood of the banister. He could not seem to catch his breath. He had to gulp for air, and the darkness was shot through with red swirlings. He reached the top of the stairs and another door. There was harsh grey light seeping around it, and he listened intently, allowing for the quick suck and thud of the pulse in his ears. When he heard nothing for a long time, he opened it. He was at the end of a long corridor lined with doors, and at the end there was another door opening on the street. Eager to get out of the building, and yet reluctant to leave as much as he knew of this world, he moved down the corridor with exaggerated caution. It was a shoddy building. The paint on the walls was cheap, and the linoleum on the floor was scuffed and warped. There were cracks in the plastering. Everything was rough, half-finished, with paint slapped over it, everything drab. There were numbers on the doors, and dirty rope mats in front of them. It was an apartment house, then, but from the way the doors were jammed almost against each other, the apartments had to be no more than cubicles. Dreary, he thought. Dreary, dreary. Who would live in such a place? Who would put up an apartment house for people of mediocre means in this neighbourhood? But when he reached the street, he saw that it was humpy and cobblestoned, the cobbling badly patched, and that all the buildings were like this one, grey-faced, hulking, ugly. There was not a building he recognised, not a stick or stone of the Himmlerstrasse, with its fresh cement roadway and its sapling trees growing along the sidewalk. And yet he knew he must be on the exact spot where the Himmlerstrasse had been. Was? And he could not quite understand. He began to walk in the direction of Unter den Linden. He was far from the shore that he could reach it on foot in his condition but he would pass through the most familiar parts of the city, and could perhaps get some inkling of what had happened. He had suspected that the probability world his apparatus could most easily adjust him for would be one in which Germany had lost the war. That was a large, dramatic difference, and though he had refined his work as well as he could, any first model of any equipment was bound to be relatively insensitive. But as he walked along, he found himself chilled and repelled by what he saw. Nothing was the same. Nothing. Even the layout of the streets had changed a little. There were new buildings everywhere. New buildings of a style and workmanship that made them old in atmosphere the day they were completed. It was the kind of total reconstruction that he had no doubt the builders stubbornly proclaimed was good as new because to say it was good as the old Berlin would have been to invite bitter smiles. The people in the streets were grim, grey-faced, and shoddy. They stared blankly at him and his suit, and once a dumpy woman carrying a string bag full of lumpy packages turned to a similar companion 
and muttered as he passed that he looked like an American with his extravagant clothes. The phrase frightened him. What kind of war had it been that there would still be Americans to be hated in Berlin in 1958? How long could it possibly have lasted to account for so many old buildings gone? What had pounded Germany so cruelly? And yet even the new buildings were genuinely some years old. Why an American? Why not an Englishman or Frenchman? He walked the grey streets, looking with a numb sense of settling shock at this grim Berlin. He saw men in shapeless uniform caps, brown trousers, cheap boots and sleazy blue shirts. There were armbands with fox bullets eye printed on them. Some of them had not bothered to shave this morning or to dress in fresh uniforms. The civilians looked at them sidelong and then pretended not to have seen them. For an undefinable but well-remembered reason, Professor Kempfer slipped by them as inconspicuously as possible. He grappled at what he saw with the dulled resources of his overtired intellect, but there was no point of reference with which to begin. He even wondered if perhaps the war was somehow still being fought, with unimaginable alliances and unthinkable antagonists, with all resources thrown into a brutal, dogged struggle from which all hope of both defeat and victory were gone, and only endless straining effort loomed up from the future. Then he turned the corner and saw the stubby military car, and soldiers in baggy uniforms with red stars on their caps. They were parked under a weather-beaten sign which read, in German, above a few lines in unreadable Cyrillic characters, Attention! You are leaving the USSR zone of occupation. You are entering the American zone of occupation. Show your papers. God in heaven, he thought, recoiling. The Bolsheviks. And he was on their side of the line. He turned abruptly, but did not move for an instant. The skin of his face felt tight. Then he broke into a stumbling walk back the way he had come. He had not come into this world blindly. He had not dared bring any goods from his apartment, of course, not with Frau Ritter to observe him, nor had he expected that his Reichsmarks would be of any use. He had provided for this by wearing two diamond-set rings. He had expected to have to walk down the jewellery district before he could begin to settle into this world, but he had expected no further difficulty. He had expected Germany to have lost the war. Germany had lost another war within his lifetime, and fifteen years later it would have taken intense study for a man in his present position to detect it. Professor Kempfer had thought it out slowly, systematically. He had not thought that a Soviet checkpoint might lie between him and the jewellery district. It was growing cold as the afternoon settled down. It had not been as warm a day to begin with, he suspected, as it had been in his Berlin. He wondered how it might be that Germany's losing a war could change the weather, but the important thing was that he was shivering. He was beginning to attract attention not only for his suit, but for his lack of a coat. He had now no place to go, no place to stay the night no way of getting food. He had no papers, and no knowledge of where to get them or what sort of manoeuvre would be required to keep him safe from arrest, if anything could save him from arrest, by Russians. Professor Kempfer began to walk with dragging steps, his body sagging and numb. More and more of the passers-by were looking at him sharply. They might well have an instinct for a hunted man. He did not dare look at the occasional policeman. He was an old man. He had run today, and shaken with nervous anticipation, and finished fifteen years' work, and it had all been a nightmarish error. He felt his heart begin to beat unnaturally in his ears, and he felt a leaping flutter begin in his chest. He stopped, 
and swayed, and then he forced himself to cross the sidewalk so he could lean against a building. He braced his back and bent his knees a little, and let his hands dangle at his sides. The thought came to him that there was an escape for him into one more world. His shoulder blade scraped a few centimetres downward against the wall. There were people watching him. They ringed him in at a distance of about two metres, looking at him with almost childish curiosity. But there was something about them that made Professor Kempfer wonder at the conditions that could produce such children. As he looked back at them, he thought that perhaps they all wanted to help him. That would account for their not going on about their business. But they did not know what sort of complications their help might bring to them, except that there would certainly be complications. So none of them approached him. They gathered around him, watching, in a crowd that would momentarily attract a fox polizier. He looked at them dumbly, breathing as well as he could, his palms flat against the wall. There were stocky old women, round-shouldered men, younger men with pinched faces, and young girls with an incalculable wisdom in their eyes. And there was a bird-like older woman coming quickly along the sidewalk, glancing at him curiously, then hurrying by, skirting around the crowd. There was one possibility of his escape to this world that Professor Kempfer had not allowed himself to consider. He pushed himself away from the wall, scattering the crowd as though by physical force, and lurched toward the passing woman. Martha! She whirled, her purse flying to the ground. Her hand went to her mouth. She whispered through her knuckles, Joachim! Joachim! He clutched her, and they supported each other. Joachim! The American bombers killed you in Hamburg. Yesterday I sent money to put flowers on your grave. Joachim! It was a mistake. It was all a mistake, Martha. We have found each other. From a distance, she had not changed very much at all. Watching her move about the room as he lay, warm and clean, terribly tired, in her bed, he thought to himself that she had not aged half as much as he. But when she bent over him with a cup of hot soup in her hand, he saw the sharp lines in her face, around her eyes and mouth, and when she spoke he heard the dry note in her voice. How many years, he thought, how many years of loneliness and grief! When had the Americans bombed Hamburg? How? What kind of aircraft could bomb Germany from bases in the Western Hemisphere? They had so much to explain to each other. As she worked to make him comfortable, the questions flew between them. It was something I stumbled on, the theory of probability worlds, of alternate universes. Assuming that the characteristic would be a difference in atomic vibration, minute, you understand, almost infinitely minute, assuming that somewhere in the gross universe every possible variation of every event must take place, then if some means could be found to alter the vibratory rate within a field, then any object in that field would automatically become part of the universe corresponding to that vibratory rate. Martha, I can bore you later. Tell me about Hamburg. Tell me how we lost the war. Tell me about Berlin. He listened while she told him how their enemies had ringed them in, how the great white wastes of Russia had swallowed their men, and the British fire-bombers had murdered children in the night, how the Wehrmacht fought and fought and smashed their enemies back time after time until all the best soldiers were dead, and how the Americans, with their dollars, had poured out countless tons of equipment to make up for their inability to fight, how, at the last, the vulture fleets of bombers had rumbled inexhaustibly across the sky, killing, 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 until all the German homes and German families had been destroyed, and how now the Americans, with a hellish bomb that had killed a hundred thousand Japanese civilians, 
now bestrode the world and tried to bully it with their bombs and their dollars into final submission. How, Professor Kempfer thought, how could such a thing have happened? Slowly he pieced it together, mortified to find himself annoyed when Martha interrupted with constant questions about his Berlin, and especially about his equipment. And, pieced together, it still refused to seem logical. How could anyone believe that Goering, in the face of all good sense, would turn the Luftwaffe from destroying the RAF bases to a ridiculous attack on English cities? How could anyone believe that German electronics scientists could persistently refuse to believe ultra-shortwave radar was practical, refuse to believe it even when the Allied hunter planes were finding surface submarines at night with terrible accuracy? What kind of nightmare world was this, with Germany divided and the Russians in control of Europe, in control of Asia, reaching for the Middle East that no Russian, not even the dreaming Tsars, had seriously expected ever to attain? Martha, we must get out of this place. We must. We will have to rebuild my machine. It would be incredibly difficult. Working clandestinely as he must, scraping components together, even now that the work had been done once, it would take several years. Professor Kempfer looked inside himself to find the strength he would need, and it was not there. It simply was gone, used up, burnt out, eaten out. Martha, you will have to help me. I must take some of your strength. I will need so many things, identity papers, some kind of work so we can eat, money to buy equipment. His voice trailed away. It was so much, and there was so little time left for him. Yet somehow they must do it. A hopelessness, a feeling of inevitable defeat came over him. It was this world. It was poisoning him. Martha's hand touched his brow. Hush, Joachim. Go to sleep. Don't worry. Everything is all right now. My poor Joachim, how terrible you look! But everyone will be all right. I must go back to work now. I am hours late already. I will come back as soon as I can. Go to sleep, Joachim. He let his breath out in a long, tired sigh. He reached up and touched her hand. Martha! He awoke to Martha's soft urging. Before he opened his eyes, he had taken her hand from his shoulder and clasped it tightly. Martha let the contract linger for a moment, then broke it gently. Joachim, my superior at the ministry is here to see you. He opened his eyes and sat up. Who? Colonel Lubintsev, from the People's Government Ministerium, where I work. He would like to speak to you. She touched him reassuringly. Don't worry. It's all right. I spoke to him. I explained. He's not here to arrest you. He's waiting in the other room. He looked at Martha dumbly. I, I, I must get dressed, he managed to say after a while. No, no. He wants you to stay in bed. He knows you're exhausted. He asked me to reassure you it will be all right. Rest in bed. I'll get him. Professor Kempfer sank back. He looked unseeingly up at the ceiling until he heard the sound of a chair being drawn up beside him, and then he slowly turned his head. Colonel Lubintsev was a stocky, ruddy-faced man with grey bristles on his scalp. He had an astonishingly boyish smile. "'Dr. Professor Kempfer, I am honoured to meet you,' he said. "'Lubintsev, Colonel, assigned as advisor to the People's Government Ministerium.' He extended his hand gravely, and Professor Kempfer shook it with a conscious effort. "'I am pleased to make your acquaintance,' Professor Kempfer mumbled. "'Not at all, Dr. Professor, not at all. Do you mind if I smoke?' Please. He watched the Colonel touch a lighter to a long cigarette, while Martha quickly found a saucer for an ashtray. 
The colonel nodded his thanks to Marcia, puffed on the cigarette, and addressed himself to Professor Kempfer while Martha sat down on a chair against the far wall. "'I have inspected your dossier,' Colonel Lubintsev said. "'That is, with a smile, our dossier and your late counterpart. I see you fit the photographs as well as could be expected. We will have to make a further identification, of course. But I rather think that will be a formality.' He smiled again. "'I am fully prepared to accept your story. It is too fantastic not to be true. Of course, sometimes foreign agents choose their cover stories with that idea in mind, but not in this case, I think. If what has happened to you could happen to any man, our dossier indicates Joachim Kempfer might well be that man.' Again the smile. "'In any counterpart.' "'You have a dossier,' Professor Kempfer said. Colonel Lubintsev's eyebrows went up in a pleased grin. "'Oh, yes! When we liberated your nation, we knew exactly what scientists were deserving of our assistance in their work, and where to find them. We had laboratories, project agendas, living quarters, everything, all ready for them. But I must admit, we did not think we would ever be able to accommodate you.' "'But now you can.' "'Yes!' Once more, Colonel Lubintsev smiled like a little boy with great fun in store. "'The possibilities of your device are as infinite as the universe. Think of the enormous help to the people of your nation, for example, if they could draw on machine tools and equipment from such an alternate places as the one you just left.' Colonel Lubintsev waved his cigarette. "'Or if, when the Americans attack us, we can transport bombs from a world where the revolution is an accomplished fact, and have them appear in North America in this.' Professor Kempfer sat up in bed. "'Martha, Martha, why have you done this to me?' "'Hush, Joachim, she said. "'Please, don't tire yourself. I have done nothing to you. You will have care now. We will be able to live together in a nice villa, and you will be able to work, and we will be together.' "'Martha!' She shook her head, her lips pursed primly. "'Please, Joachim, times have changed a great deal here. I explained to the Colonel that your head was probably still full of the old Nazi propaganda. He understands. You will learn to see it for what it was, and you will help put the Americans back in their place.' Her eyes filled suddenly with tears. "'All the years I went to visit your grave as often as I could. All the years I paid for flowers.' and all the nights I cried for you. But I am here, Martha, I am here, I am not dead. Joachim, Joachim, she said gently, am I to have had all my grief for nothing? I have brought a technical expert with me, Colonel Lubintsev went on, as though nothing had happened. If you will tell him what facilities you will need, we can begin preliminary work immediately. He rose to his feet. I will send him in. I myself must be going. He put out his cigarette and extended his hands. I have been honoured, Dr. Professor Kempfer. Yes, Professor Kempfer whispered. Yes, honoured. He raised his hand, pushed it toward the colonel's, but could not hold it up long enough to reach. It fell back to the coverlet, woodenly, and Professor Kempfer could not find the strength to move it. Goodbye. He heard the colonel walk out with a few murmured words for Martha. He was quite tired, and he heard only a sort of hum. He turned his head when the technical expert came in. The man was all eagerness, all enthusiasm. Joachim, this is amazing. Perhaps I should introduce myself. I worked with your counterpart during the war. We were quite good friends. I am George Tanzler. Joachim, how are you? Professor Kempfer looked up. His lips twisted. "'I think I am going away again, George,' he whispered. THE END Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Think about it. These stories were written a lifetime ago.'